Good morning, everybody. Uh, once again, welcome. Um, good to know that you all are doing well and staying safe. Um, I hope things get better for all of us. And um, looking forward to seeing you all in person. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, let's get started. Yeah, uh, can I request uh, one of us to just lead us in prayer? Uh, Kanan, do you mind uh, leading us in prayer this morning? Quite a lot of disturbance, but uh, sorry, I can't uh, hear you. Yeah, there's a lot of disturbance. I'll mute you. Okay. Sorry, Conan, there was a lot of disturbance uh, on the line. Couldn't really hear you, which is why I muted you. Um, sorry about that. Um, right, uh, let's just, uh, you know, I'll, I'll pray and uh, we'll get started, okay? So, Father, we come into your presence right now. We submit um, the, our sessions for today, our lectures for today uh, into your hands. Lord, we depend and lean on your understanding. Holy Spirit, uh, open our eyes to the wonderful things of your word, Lord. And help us understand as we study uh, you know, some of the practical things of worship ministry. Jesus, give us insights and wisdom and knowledge. Father, I thank you for this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Okay, uh, everybody. So um, just to do a quick recap, we finished uh, the first chapter with a lot of subsections on the worship ministry, how it was organized through the Bible. Right, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, from the tabernacle of Moses to the tabernacle of David, right? How the ministry of worship was organized. And um, in last week, we completed uh, at page 25 and the beginning of page 26 um, on the few things, the lessons that we can learn from David's worship team, right? Um, and we, we looked at that entire chapter of First Chronicles chapter 25 uh, from verse 1 to 10, actually. Um, so one of the last points that we learned uh, from the David's worship team was uh, he set apart his men to, be, to, be, to minister unto the Lord. And they were not involved with anything else. Their only job, their only duty was to minister unto the Lord in the temple of the Lord. So they were set apart, which is calling us to be set apart. Um, it's just another word for calling us to be holy uh, unto the Lord, right? And um, ministry is another lesson that we learned, is we learning to serve people because love plus service equals ministry. And we see that in John 13, uh, as Jesus stooped down to uh, wash the feet of his just disciples. That is love and service. And that is ministry, really. And submission is another word for humility. Okay, when you say, I submit myself under the authority of the king, you are humbling yourself to the rule of that person over you, right? Uh, when you humble yourself to your worship pastor, your worship leader, or your senior pastor, now you are humbling yourself saying, "Is okay, I am humbling myself to the authority that person has uh, in that role. And... Two, two of the important lessons uh, we'll see was that all of the people who David chose to minister before the Lord, they were all trained and they were all skilled in music for the Lord. Okay, and uh, so we can draw a parallel, take things from anything that we do for God. Uh, we need to get better at what we do and we need to be skilled. Not necessarily the best because it's hard to define best, but skill has no limit. So every day you can be better than yesterday. Right? Today I can be better than yesterday in whatever I am good at. Right? We can be good at dancing or painting or singing, playing an instrument, graphic designing, uh, video editing. Whatever it is, you do it unto the Lord, be it skilled and trained. And finally, we see that uh, all of them, like 
the teacher and the student, the young and the old were part of his team. It was not exclusively only for young people. It was not exclusively only for the older folks, but everybody with one heart, they were united in service unto the Lord. So that was the last bits uh, of, uh, of worship from the Bible, right? From the David's tabernacle uh, we saw in chapter one. Okay. Uh, so what were some of the key points that you kind of uh, really enjoyed from the, uh, enjoyed as in might not be the right word, but what were some of the key points that kind of stood out to you and kind of impressed uh, on your heart that you could take away? Speak to me. From whatever we've covered so far, what was the one or two things that kind of stood out as a highlight for you from chapter one? Speakers, anybody? Kanan? Dave? Yes, Pastor. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now, yes. Uh, so, so uh, from chapter one, what there, there, there were a lot of things that uh, we could go through that we learned from how, what worship is, how, what we see, uh, in the temple of God and uh, worship in the second temple and especially uh, what worship is uh, when we look at the book of Psalms um, who to worship where when and how and even uh, when we look at uh, the worship in the New Testament uh, and the, in the temple of um, tabernacle and in the especially in the te at temple of uh, David's tabernacle so the the lessons that we uh, that we get from the worship, uh, it was not just only uh, adoring God, but it was a practical thing that uh, the Israelites, uh, the the people in that time when they were living, they had right. to do. Uh, it was not just uh, worshiping, meaning uh, coming and adoring and singing and dancing, but it was something that they had to live their life. And they have to be away from uh, from the the Canaanites, from the people that they were living up among. Right, right. Um, so that was what uh, the important thing uh, thing was for 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 the Israelites. So it is for us today, as they have to live apart, they have to set apart, set, set their life apart. So are we. Right. And that's what uh, when we look at it, I I think it's important for uh, all all of us. For our God is holy God. Yeah. So if we, if we, if if we are to minister of God, uh, who is holy, we are we we said to be, we are to be holy, just as right. how he is. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. Thank you for sharing that beautifully. Uh, anybody else? Uh, yeah. What were your key takeaways? Your highlights from chapter one? What do you think that you can apply uh, in ministry and worship ministry uh, in the days to come? What was it? Aaron, would you like to share? Yeah, uh, yeah, Pastor. Uh, one thing I uh, took away uh, from this chapter one is that um, it's just a one line, okay? Uh, with intimacy, he will use us, he will use you, but without intimacy, you will use God. It really do me. This line really took me off. And one thing I have learned is that, um, see, uh, in the days of Moses, days of David, you know, uh, only the high priests they used to enter the most of the holiest of the holy space once a year. Right. But right. it's just a, uh, it's just a good privilege for us to enter the uh, God presence without any permission. Or, yeah, mm. something like that. So it really okay. took me away. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, Siddharth. Oh. Yeah, Pastor. I'm not sure this from the first chapter, but last time we learned something from love that service is equal to ministry. Mm -hmm. And uh, that really touched me. Like, I was, you know, mostly we go to ministry with passion in the beginning. 
and after that we start looking for you know only money or something like that like we are expecting something that may be blessings mm. like finances or some provisions the pastor will provide sure. or something like that sure. they really don't go like it's like we are losing the first love that we had for the ministry right you know when you say love the service is equal to ministry because i'm also kind of doing a part time uh, you know job kind of like that a caretaking of one of my friends parents sure and when i came in the starting i always thought about you know money making minded but you know when you told me i was actually doing ministry to them i was actually yeah. kind of serving them and yeah. to do that i need love yeah you just cannot expect money and come into it yeah yeah thank you so that thank you for being honest uh, i so beautifully sharing that i this is wonderful yeah it's amazing uh keep up the, continue to do what you're doing that's awesome uh, anybody else uh, manu kiran thomas neelam this quickly is one of the major thing is uh, humbleness uh, when uh, uh, when god uh, using us to possibly somewhere knowingly and only the pride will come and knowingly and only that just to work it out uh but i <laughs> somehow i learned long back that trip i heard uh, the thing will keep in mind to be but that's very very important the devil will attack in that area uh yeah that's really touched obedience and humble is a very key point to grow up in the ministry uh, i think that's right. that's really stood for me. thank you thomas thanks for sharing yeah uh kiran and manu anything this last yes. we'll continue <laughs> yeah so uh, i learned from uh, the first chapter so like uh, praising god it's like uh, so many thing the world the nature he the god created so the praising god to everything every breath and every every sight we uh, i i wanna just express like so many testimonies there every life every moment the testimony is there even uh, i i learned like obedience god's obedience is there and uh, the movement and the receiving holy spirit and leading the praising to god and and humbleness and love to another and forgiveness so many thing and how the moses uh, moses tabernacle he i i learned and then after the david tabernacle and the, all those people that how they praise god and all the right. sacrifice and everything yeah thank you so much awesome thank you kiran hey thanks guys thanks everybody for sharing uh, you know for what what your takeaways from um so it's, it's wonderful to know that i mean there was something that you could take away okay um so uh, let's continue um i'll share the notes for us on the screen okay uh so as mentioned now the first chapter was all about uh the biblical and the theological aspect of uh worship and ministry okay um uh, i'm very intentionally breaking uh those you know those words into two different things so when we say worship ministry it most often we take we look at it as just one big thing right uh thank you manu for sharing that yeah intimacy with god yeah with obedience yeah thank you okay so as i was saying uh when we just say worship ministry we tend to look at it as one word even though we know that it's not worship ministry but it's two different things isn't it so it's worship and ministry okay so through the first chapter we see how uh we see uh, the theological aspect uh, we see the uh, you know the biblical approach to worship and ministry okay so from going on uh, henceforth from chapter 2 onwards uh, we're going to get a little bit more practical um you know approach to uh, worship ministry okay uh 
we see, okay, how we can go about organizing the worship ministry in our day and age today, how we can help our churches improve. How should you as a leader or a pastor uh, get better? Uh, you know, how, how are you to take care of your team, et cetera, et cetera. So it's going to be more of a practical approach. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, starting us off, what we thought was be best and nice uh, is from chapter two, we, we looked at uh, uh, the history of uh, worship okay through the ages uh, from the centuries that's gone before us from people who've from generations that's gone before us you know in the past uh, so i'm sure because there's something that we can learn from history right uh, so that's why this chapter is all about looking at the past uh, and see how the past um, their worship as is has influenced our present Okay, um, if you never, if you did not like a history as a student in your school, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, but you know, let's try and make it interesting and see uh, if you know. Uh, because history is a good thing, right? As I've mentioned in the notes, um, like, have you ever been to a place, uh, you know, where your friend or someone said, you know, or or even if you go back to your old school classroom and say, it's like, you know in this very place, this happened, right? There's some history attached to that uh, space or, you know, in 1995 or in 2002, uh, at this very room, uh, you know, so and so, uh, we experienced this, uh, you know, something like that, extra, isn't it? Uh, and if you're going for, uh, you know, some kind of a tour, uh, you know, it, there is always this tour guide, right? If you go to Taj Mahal, there will be these tour guides who want to t share the history of the of of the Taj Mahal, right? right? In in this century, this was built at this very ground. Shah Jahan stood, and you know he directed how it has to be built. And so you suddenly get this point: Wow, you know, I'm standing in this uh, you know historical space. Uh, and uh, and for as, us as Christians. Um, you know, when we go, I mean, I've seen a lot of uh, uh, of my friends, uh, Christian friends, including my dad, actually, who went to Israel. And, uh, and he, when he came back, he said, you know, just to be in the place and walk in the streets where Jesus walked, to know that Jesus walked, um, it gave them a different feeling. They would be overwhelmed, right? So what was the significant there is that something happened in the past uh, that connects, that ties our faith today. Right. So that's what history kind of, uh, you know, does to us, you know, so what we the ground that we are standing on the ground that we are calling as Christianity or the theology of Christianity or worship ministry, etc. Whatever it is, we are standing on the history of the worship exp expression in our context. OK, who have creatively led, who have sacrificed uh, and led expressions across times from hundreds and hundreds of years, you know, and here we are. And so, uh, you know, I believe that uh, there is great wisdom, uh, you know, in our worship past. And if we look for it, we'll find strengthening the worship and discipleship life of our churches today. If you look at our past, and I'm sure we will find a strengthening encouragement um, of the worship and the discipleship life of the churches that's gone before us. Okay, and uh, hymns are a classic example to look at. It's it's a wonderful place for us to start. All right. Um, so we all know the uh, we all know the hymn "Amazing Grace," how sweet the sound. Right. Um, it's more than it's more than just another hymn that is sung uh, at funerals or weddings, uh, you know, but mostly in the funerals they sing it. And, uh, and you know, because it's like, okay, it's another funeral service. And in every funeral service, they sing Amazing Grace. Let's just sing Amazing Grace and move on. But a little do we understand or take time to know the history behind that hymn, right? Uh, and we see that in... In March 9th of 1748, a person by name of John Newton, right? Uh, he was a sailor working for the British Army. Okay, he was working for the British Navy, 
you know, for the, all the all the ship that carried the slaves. Uh, so it says uh, in March 9th, 1748, a young captain on a slave ship is uh, is awakened by the cries of the ship is sinking. The ship is sinking. Recalling words from a book he is reading called The Imitation of Christ by Thomas A. Kempis. Um, and so finally moved by, you know, the ship was sinking. Uh, he was about to die, but somehow people get saved. And John Newton reflects back from that moment on, from March 9th, from March 10th onwards, he reflects back and he slowly turns uh, to the Bible, starts studying the Bible, uh, you know, and gets saved. And then he writes these most beautiful uh, lyrics ever written. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Uh, so, you know, once you understand who John Newton was, you know, uh, the person, the sto uh, the person behind the song, it makes all the more sense, isn't it? It's even when you when, when we read the Psalms, uh, for example, if when you read Psalm 23, the title says it's a Psalm of David, right? Um, it's a person. David is a real person, like you and me, a, an actual human being who lived, right? Uh, if we don't understand David, it's very hard for us to understand Psalm 23. Right. Like, for example, if, uh, you know, one of us is good at an, a painting or artist artistry, um, you know, it's one thing to just look at the uh, product and say, oh, it's, it's wonderful. It's nice. And it's another thing to look at the person who did that and say, oh, you did this. You, uh, you know, have you said, have you, I'm sure we've said this to each other, right? It's like, you cooked. You made this biryani. Yeah, that's wonderful. You know, uh, it's sim similar like that, isn't it? Then we un when we see that how John Newton was, uh, uh, you know, how is a back, or what his background was, um, and then when we see those words, "Amazing grace, how sweet the sound," it all of a sudden gives us a different perspective. We now understand that there's a history to it, and uh, because of that, what he did and what he wrote. We now today sing those, uh, you know, those hymns in churches, right? Um, so that's it's it's a beautiful place to start. I thought, okay, um, but let's take a look at a more some of the more uh, famous hymn writers, right? Um, Philip P. Bliss uh, from 1838 to 1876. Uh, look at all their the years that they were around. Is they're really old. <laughs> Right. Uh, and he was an American hymn writer and a gospel singer who wrote the words and music for uh, um, for such hymns as Almost Persuaded, Hallelujah, What a Savior, and Let the Lower Lights Be Burning. Uh, hallelujah, What a Savior. It's okay if you don't know it. They're old. Um, and also, uh, we also understand that most of us, uh, you know, we come from uh, regional churches we, where we don't necessarily sing all these hymns. OK, so uh, I want you to know that I also understand that. So it's OK if you don't know them, but we are just trying to you know, look at some of the history of the West that's influenced the Church of India as well. We'll get to that in just a second. OK, um, another hymn writer uh, by, by name William B. Brad, Bradbury. Uh, he wrote hymns like, He leadeth me, uh, Jesus loves me. Uh, I sing that for my son every time I have to put him to sleep. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. <laughs> right? um, you see that uh, for me, it's, a it's just another lullaby <laughs> to sing for my son. But um, it was written hundreds and hundreds of years ago uh, by this person. Uh, Francis R. Uh, have a have a gal, uh, take my life and let it be is another famous hymn. And Elisha Hoffman, uh, uh, one of the hymns that uh, they wrote was, uh, "Are you washed in the blood? Are you washed in in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb." <laughs> you know that one. Uh, William James uh, Kirkpatrick, uh, "Lead me to Calvary, Jesus saves." Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. 
Okay, uh, Robert Lowry shall be gathered at the river, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Uh, was written by Robert Lowry and John Newton once again mentioned here for the hymn that he wrote, Amazing Grace. Isaac Watts, another famous hymn writer, uh, an English pastor, preacher, poet, uh, who wrote the hymn. He's written more than 600 hymns. And some of these people have written more than thousands and thousands of hymns. It's unfortunate that we've lost a lot of them. Uh, we've lost a lot of their literature, uh, you know, which was written. Uh, and just a handful of them remain. Um, I mean, just to think that, for example, Charles Wesley here, he's written over 5,500 hymns. 5,500 hymns, guys. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just hard, isn't it? Uh, one of the famous hymns that we sing for every Christmas is Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Uh, beautiful, beautiful. Okay. All right. Uh, so I think it, it's, it's good when we look at hymns. Uh, it tells us, uh, you know, the richness of, uh, of not just theology, but uh, the complexity of music as well. Right. Uh, the hymns, uh, I, I use it all the time to teach my students, uh, you know, voice and harmony. Uh, how do I get better in singing harmony? You know, I always take the example of the hymns. And that's why now when you go to some of the more mainline churches, say Baptist or uh, Lutherans, Methodist churches, um, for them, like, you know, you sing hymn, it's like a revival is moving in their churches, right? Um, so hymns are a beautiful place uh, to look at. Uh, they are rich in liturgy. They are rich in literature, rich in literature and in music, uh, you know? So they are wonderful, right? Um, but now let's see, uh, let's come back to a more modern time. Okay, let's look at how the hymns, uh, you know, settled in for hundreds of years in the churches, um, and then how contemporary music had an effect uh, of the church in the West, okay? So traditional versus contemporary. Hey guys, are you, are you, are you all with me? Am I going fast? As, oh, you're okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, awesome. Okay, good to know. Thank you. Um, right, so let's take a look at uh, CCM. Okay, it's one of the very important terms that we need to uh, remember um, for modern times, which simply means Christian contemporary music. Okay, so um, let's rewind back to the year 1960s. So it's, it is around this decade, in that, in that decade from 1960s, 60 to 70s, in that in the decade, um, all these mainstream churches, the mainline churches like Baptist, Methodist, uh, Brethren, uh, Lutherans, etc., uh, etc., et they were losing a lot of young people from the church. They were just, they found it like, you know, uh, all the hymns and all these things very boring. It, the church was not exciting or interesting and whatnot. Okay, so the teenagers and the youth, uh, they they stopped attending churches. Uh, they were losing, the church was losing young people in, in, in vast majority of numbers. Okay, they wanted to, uh, these young people want to engage with the same kind of uh, rock and roll kind of a music that, that, you know, that the secular artists were playing, right? So in the notes I've mentioned, so is there every, the late 1960s saw the birth of the widespread movement Okay, this is a very famous movement, uh, like a revival, in other words, that happened in the West, which simply means the young people who had come to faith in Jesus and wanted to express that faith in the way that was more relevant. Okay, relevant means for that day and age, like, uh, for example, like how we have uh, Bible translations now, isn't it? Uh, some of our, our elderly people, they prefer the KJV version, thou, the, shalt, etc. Right? And then we have the NLT version uh, or the message translation, you know, or the passion translation. It's a, it is more relevant for today's generation. They don't necessarily want to read thou, the, uh, I don't want to read King James version, <laughs> uh, right? I like the NIV um, 
Right. We, so we choose, similarly, you know, these uh, these young people of 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 that day and age, they wanted to express their faith in a more relevant fashion, in a more relevant way, right? Um, so, in the 1970s, this movement that was happening, where a lot of young people were getting saved, like a revival, was called as the Jesus Movement. You might have heard of it, you might not, uh, but it's okay if you have not, okay? Uh, there were a huge bunch of people getting saved. You know, people in the streets were getting healed, left, right, center. And one of the revivals that they, uh, you know, mostly widely talking about is the Azusa revival. Uh, there's actually a book from APC, the pastors put together, about the revivals of, of the history. And I would encourage you to read them. Uh, you know, to be encouraged of what God has done again in the history, right? Um, it's it's wonderful. So, the 1970, the term Jesus movement was being fielded by its members. Uh, initially, the journalists, okay, the media called it the hippie movement. Uh, now, hippie people from the west coast okay, of the um, of the United States of America, okay, which is the California side. Uh, uh, the local, the Americans call people from them uh, from that region as hippies. So uh, you know they also name that movement uh, as a hippie movement because Jesus movement uh, was more bore more fruit in the West Coast. Okay, that is the California side. So if you want to quickly look at where California is, you can go to Google Images, uh, maps of United States of America. You'll see where California is. So that is the West Coast. Okay. Um, so why is all of this important? This is the contemporary thing. Okay, so now we understand in the 1960s, the mainline churches were losing a lot of young people, but at the same time, there was a revival happening, okay, uh, which was called as the Jesus Movement. Okay, so we know that this revival movement was happening. Now, during that time, in 1968, there was a secular band called the People, okay, secular band. Now, the leader, lead singer, lead vocalist of that band was called, was Larry David Norman, okay? Larry Norman, famously known as just Larry Norman, okay? Um, he was saved in the Jesus movement, through the Jesus movement. Okay, he got uh, he got saved, converted, whatever we want to use, uh, and he is often remembered as the father of Christian rock. Okay, he's uh, yeah, he's popularly known as with that title that he is the father of Christian rock. Okay, uh, his style we know that you know his style was not encouraged uh, in the church, was not liked by the church, um, and uh, he was also very controversial in some of the songs and albums that he released. You know, um, like for example, uh, so though his style was not initially well received by many in the Christian community of the time, he continued throughout his career to create controversial hard rock songs such as. Why should the devil have all the good music? Uh, <laughs> oh boy, I found that uh, yeah, that's just amazing, right? Because again, back uh, back then, a, an electric guitar or a drum kit in church was a devil's instrument. You're like, how can you have the devil's instrument in the church? We don't use that. We only use the pipe organ uh, and not guitar. Actually, honestly, in one point of time, uh, when hymns was introduced in the church like 300 years ago, uh, they thought the church did not accept hymns back then because they thought it was too modern. You know, So in every generation, every generation has a different sound. And as a church, or, you know, there's a very important lesson for us as leaders to learn here is every generation has a sound. And we cannot say, I, uh, you know, we cannot worship God with this music. We cannot worship God with that, et cetera, et cetera, and whatnot. Simply because every generation has a sound. And we need to embrace, uh, you know, the movement. Uh, we need to see how we can nurture them and guide them, et cetera, right? Um, so at a time when Jesus music was new, 
that most people didn't even know it existed. Norman, that is Larry Norman, uh, took a huge financial and career risks to nurture a more contemporary form of Christian music. Okay, he took, uh, he sacrificed. Uh, you know, this is one of the ground, the historical grounds that we are standing on is the sacrifice of Larry Norman that he made, that he took, uh, you know, financially, uh, career-wise, moving from, see, it's for a secular artist to go from, you know, from a secular platform to a gospel platform, uh, you sacrifice the fame, you sacrifice the popularity, um, the money, everything, right? Uh, and because simply because Larry Norman tasted Jesus and he found that Jesus is the truth, he is the real deal, um, you know. And then he goes on to create this movement, this, the Jesus music that was born during the Jesus movement. Okay, and some of the artists are the pioneers uh, who were influenced during that period um, are some of the names that I have mentioned. Once again, you don't have to know, uh, you know, uh, uh, all of them, uh, you know, by name, etc. It's just for information. Okay, but uh, here it is, Daryl Mansfield, Sweet Comfort Band, another team called Servant or. John Michael Talbot uh, in Striper, uh, the second chapter of Acts, they were pretty famous actually. And Phil Keegy is a very famous musician, uh, you know, acoustic guitarist. So there was a time where, uh, you know, Jimi Hendrix, so uh, there were contemporaries, right? Um, and the, during the same period, Jimi Hendrix was very famous in the 70s and, and all, right? He was a secular artist. And so there was an, uh, there's an, there's an interview, uh, interviewer who asks uh, Jimi Hendrix, it's like, um, uh, how does it feel like to be the best guitarist ever? And Jimi Hendrix says, I don't know, ask Phil Kigi how it feels. Uh, so Phil Kigi was uh, really skillful. He's still around, uh, he's wonderful. Uh, and uh, hey, some of these uh, names like Petra uh, and uh, Keith Green, uh, Keith Green and Petra, they were very influential in my life. Like I grew up listening to Petra's music. I still listen to it. Uh, and Keith Green. Uh, I'm not sure if you will know some of his songs. Um, Create in me a clean heart, oh God. Renew right spirit within me. Right, that's by Keith Green. Another song is, uh, Oh Lord, you're beautiful. Your face is all I see. Okay, that's another music. Uh, another song, uh, just as an example, by Keith Green, uh, who uh, died, unfortunately, in, a, in an airplane crash. So all of these artists were, were pioneers, uh, were very influential, uh, you know, in... Uh, just riding that wave of revival, that Jesus music, uh, which is now known as the Christian contemporary music. These artists were very influential in that season. They were kind of laying the foundation to what uh, the CCM will go on to become this huge, uh, you know, uh, deal um, in, in, in the worship circle. Okay. Um, now I'll share a, probably share a link to this video. It's a YouTube video for 40 minutes that talks about the music that evolved during Jesus' time. Uh, I'll share with this. I'll put it, I'll paste it on the classroom uh, and the stream section. So you can just watch it and just learn about the history of it, okay? Um, so we, have, we looked at the 60s and the 70s, uh, you know, how there was a shift happening from Jesus' movement, right? Um, and then we step in now to the 80s. Now, from, from the 60s to the 80s, there's 20 years, right? And in 20 years, again, music has evolved. What Larry Norman, who was known as the father of uh, Christian rock, at that point of time, it seemed like there was only one genre of music, which was this rock or Christian rock. And by the 80s, it's kind of taking this... Uh, it's evolved into in its final form, so to say, right? Uh, it's come to this 
uh, last final finishing stages uh, that's it's it was fully developed in Christian contemporary music praise and worship music uh, you know and suddenly there's genres like uh, Christian country music Christian pop Christian rock Christian metal Christian hardcore Christian punk um, you know uh, and etc etc and all of the uh, and again once again I've mentioned uh, all the names uh, uh, of the band and the artists influenced during this period from the 80s, uh, you know, who grew, um, who are very influential and who are very, who are very famous. Uh, Petra, as mentioned again, uh, Petra simply means rock, okay, <laughs> the Greek word uh, rock. So they're like, okay, you know. Uh, we're going to play rock music because Petra, and we're going to call ourselves Petra because it simply means rock. And uh, Jesus is a rock. He's a rock of ages. So let's play some rock music. Uh, how cool is that? Right. Um, and then Amy Grant, um, Sandy Patty, Michael W. Smith, uh, DC Talk, Jesus Freak. That's another famous song that we used to sing. Uh, what will people say if they know that I'm a Jesus freak? You know, that was by uh, DC Talk. I forget the name. What was his name? Uh, forget the artist. Yeah, Toby Mac. Yes, Toby Mac. Um, and then you, uh, you, know, you have uh, Ron Canoli, uh, Blessing and Honor, Ancient of Days, right? Don Moen, Give Thanks, uh, Kent Henry, uh, Casting Crowns, etc., etc. Now, this is not the complete list, obviously. It's just, uh, uh, it's just some of the names that I could think of, and I've just mentioned them, you know, who've been very influential in my life. Like people like Paul Wilbur, uh, you, I mean, you really have to listen to his songs, and, uh, and Michael W. Smith, Stephen Curtis Chapman, uh, incredible, and one of the most powerful worship leaders I've come across uh, who would lead with authority. Uh, you know, but with a uh, Christian rock kind of a music was Carmen. Okay, guys. Uh, I mean, if you haven't listened or heard of Carmen, uh, he unfortunately passed away. Uh, I think uh, January of this year. I was very sad uh, because he was awesome. The way he would lead worship with authority uh, and the importance that he gave to the word of God. It was amazing. He had a huge impact on my life that it's okay. You know, it doesn't matter what genre of music you use to worship him, as long as you are worshiping uh, him. And uh, I learned that from Carmen and most of these uh, individual artists, Michael W. Smith, Stephen Curtis Chapman, etc., etc. Okay, so this is the, the, the 90s, uh, 80s. And uh, so actually, let me just pause here and... Uh, play um, music uh, a video for us I, uh, we have only the five minutes I hope uh, okay let's see how the uh, it's a video about uh, evolution of worship music uh, let's take a look at it okay I hope you all can see um, not yet all right let's go be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence, my light. Oh, praise him, oh, praise him. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abided still. His kingdom is forever. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. 
mighty, the King of creation. O my soul, praise Him, for He is thy health and salvation. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. And the things of earth will grow strange. is very near. Not how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you spread His love to everyone. You want to pass it on. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah! Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! We are going to see the King. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns. From heaven above with wisdom, power, and love, our God is an awesome God. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar. Beyond our galaxy, you are holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Your love never fails and never gives up. Above the waves, when no 
good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. Our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before I see you move. Okay, I think uh, that's enough. <laughs> uh, I hope you all uh, can I enjoy that. Uh, yeah, he's he's done such a good job in putting together songs from 500 BC uh, all the way till this decade, uh, and you see how he's uh, how we, how music has evolved, isn't it? Um, it's 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 a beautiful. It kind of sets the context to what we are kind of, uh, actually studying. Right. Uh, so what we'll do, we'll take a break. Uh, you can take extra uh, three minutes or so and we'll get started. All right. I'll pause the recording now and I'll see you all after the break. Enjoy.